Leaving menu bar. Everyone, welcome. Skype we trademark. Are, we're very happy to have everybody here. And we're asking our pianist. Level to one. General audio. To stop for the moment, he will play again when we have our. Uh, speakers slash headphones left pair in real. Speakers combo box speakers slash headphones left the, pair. The sounds that speakers hear slash headphones. Computer instructions on uh, a computer that is used by visual visually impaired people. It's quite impressive uh, how these experts on assistive technology handle the equipment. Speaker My name is Tina Tinde. I work as a diversity and gender coordinator at the Interna International Federation of uh, the Speakers Red Cross um, and the Red Crescent um, Societies. Uh, we are very, very Skype happy trade. to be here today at the um, Humanitarian Hall of the International Committee of the Red Cross, our sister organization. And we are here to mark the 10th anniversary of the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Congratulations, everyone. We know there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, I saw a study by an American organization that found that uh, only 27% of uh, national um, uh, constitutions actually prohibit discrimination against people with disabilities. There was a, a study by a UN agency that found that 86% of persons with disabilities were not consulted in the planning of a disaster risk prevention and response. So we are here to learn from people with disabilities, to hear how they got where they are now as assistive technology experts. We have our moderator who is an advisor on uh, disability at the High Commission for Human Rights. And we have via Skype, we have Dominique. Can you hear me, Dominique? We have Dom yes, he can hear me. So he is a volunteer with the Red Cross in Trinidad and Tobago. So I think we will have a very interesting uh, time here together. We would like to have it interactive. As long as we use microphones, everybody can hear. And we also have live captioning. So as you see, this, um, this meeting is also accessible for people who are hard of hearing. And uh, we're very happy to have that service. So just remember to, when you speak or ask about something, just uh, please state your name and where you work. I'm now happy to give the floor to the, to the uh, hostess of the event, Mary Vents from ICRC. Please, Mary. Dear friends, dear guests, it's a great pleasure for me to warmly welcome you again to the humanitarian in, in, humanitarium in Geneva for an event which brings together people of extreme courage, resilience, and commitment. A year ago, we heard very powerful testimonies from athletes with disabilities who explained how sport helps to break barriers and enable social integration. Today, with our partners from the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent, and thank you, Tine, for organizing this event, we are once again welcoming people who defy disability every day, and along the way, teach all of us a lesson in confronting challenges. We are all looking forward to the entire program, the music, as well as the discussion. We are eager to learn so as to be able to ensure that humanitarian responses are inclusive and always attuned to the needs of people with disability. Our movement colleagues all over the world do this every day. They encounter people with disabilities, they listen to their stories, they seek to understand their needs and to contribute to efforts aiming at rebuilding lives. Helping and aiding people to walk again is an incredible gift that countless victims of armed conflict may receive in physical rehabilitation centers supported by the ICRC, the movement, and many other actors around the globe. Coping with disability is tough, and it's even tougher in countries ripped apart by war. Stigma and rejection often accompany people with disabilities as they may be considered as a burden to society. An artificial arm 
or a leg can give people a chance to be self-reliant and to be viewed as a resource and a full member of society. Being disabled does not mean being powerless. On the contrary, being able to walk again, to do sports, to start your own business, to be able to do daily tasks by yourself, all of these things help people with disability to contribute as full members to their societies. I'll bring just two examples to illustrate, and these come from uh, the work of the ICRC. Last year in India, we were involved in organizing the Enable Makeathon to crowdsource solutions entirely centered on people with disabilities. Participants with disabilities identified challenges and worked together with inventors, students, engineers, other persons with disabilities and civil society to co-create solutions. What emerged were solutions that were cheap enough for people to buy, robust enough for their needs and for their environments, and went well beyond the locomotive needs. In Afghanistan, where we support seven physical rehabilitation centers with over 95% of our staff uh, themselves uh, affected by, uh, by disabilities. Um, they are providing life-changing services as physiotherapists, orthopedic technicians, administrators, center managers, and sport coaches. For the ICRC, such interventions aim at the social reintegration of people with disabilities, where they play an active role in society and are not only recipients of assistance. This has proven to be one of the biggest success stories. And I just mentioned uh, one of the heads of one of our centers in, in Kabul, Mr. Najmuddin. He himself is a double amputee. And he says in, in a very interesting way, he talks about why his work is meaningful to him and talks about how seeing people's lives transformed is what actually motivates him. He's, the, people arrive at the centers, he says, completely dependent on others for help and daily functioning. And after a few weeks, sometimes a few months, they return to their families with a high level of self-reliance and also full of hope. These examples are meant uh, to illustrate how important it is that programs be designed to work with people with disabilities and not for them. Programs must be at the same time people-centered and environment-centered. So this is what matters for me today, that we celebrate not only the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, but that we celebrate the strength and the courage of persons with disabilities and their will to move on despite the odds. Working with persons with disabilities not only teaches, but it inspires. Each one of us has a right to a life of dignity and self-respect. With that, I wish you all a wonderful International Day of, of uh, Persons with Disabilities. Be inspired. Thank you very much, Marie, for your words. Um, thank you all for being here. My name is Facundo Chavez Penichas. I am the Human Rights and Disability Advisor of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, it's a, a, real, a real pleasure for me to be here moderating this table. Um, one of the things that OHHR does is to mainstream uh, the human rights-based approach to disability. And one of the things that we have come to realize, and now listening to Mary, um, it's, uh, it, we, we, we still have a, lot, a long way to go on, on how do we merge uh, the different perspectives that traditionally um, the humanitarian context and the human rights uh, perspectives are now bringing together, how do we work on these uh, complementarities. From the human rights-based approach to disability, what we say uh, and what the convention actually uh, adopts as a, as a, as a concept around disability is that the barriers are no longer on the person. The barriers for participation are actually on the environment, 
on the attitudes and how the system is designed to include persons with disabilities in a larger context. And this, as is valid for, for society in general, uh, it's also valid for the humanitarian context and to humanitarian programming and response. Um, how do we make persons with disabilities be, be part of it? It's, uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge and we are happy to be working together with the ICRC and with other, um, in, in trying to mainstream uh, this, this perspective and, and how to better react to this. Uh, the other precondition, let's say, that facilitates the realization of the human rights-based approach uh, to disability is how do we solve those barriers that exist in the environment. And today we have the pleasure of having two uh, very good examples of how a person with disabilities themselves through the use of technology are providing the necessary support for persons with disabilities to participate more actively. Um, and this is support, it's not uh, it's not a, a medically based uh, approach to what we need, but a, a way of enhancing our abilities uh, through supportive technology. So without further ado and without monopolizing the conversation, I would like to ask Ansil to, to take the floor and to move on a cool conversation around this issue. Hello, good day, uh, wherever you might be around the world or here in Geneva. My name is Ansel Torres, I'm the president and founder of the W.R. Torres Foundation for the Blind. I was born on the island of Trinidad in the Caribbean, near Venezuela, for those of you who have never heard of Trinidad before. Um, I actually was asked that question when I arrived at the airport. Uh, where exactly is Trinidad? Well, yes, it's off the coast of Venezuela. Um, and I'd also uh, like to introduce my partner in crime and dear wife, uh, Sonia Torres. Sonia? Yes, hello, hi. Yes, she's, she's a little on the shy side. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know how she started talking to me with being that shy. <laughs> anyway, um, I would like uh, to express uh, my sincere thanks and appreciation for the folks at uh, IFRC, um, Ms. Tina Tinder, and all of you who um, went through the effort to set up this event. Uh, persons with disabilities are frequently ignored uh, in, the car in the corridors of power, whether it's here in Europe, the United States, in Trinidad and Tobago, we face tremendous challenges. And one of the things that was very important for Tina and the way she does things is to ensure that persons with disabilities are placed at the center of solving, or, uh, helping to solve their own issues. And that is to her credit, and I'd like to issue her a round of applause for taking that approach. <laughs> Nothing about us without us. That is our clarion call in the disabled community. And the more that is done, I believe, the better we are going to be able to uh, advance uh, our cause here. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the folks uh, who are hosting us in this beautiful facility. Uh, uh, the ICRC. Uh, this is uh, very, uh, I guess, accommodate, very appropriate for what we're trying to do here. Uh, thanks for all the wonderful uh, technology that you have here, and uh, thanks for uh, making this possible. Uh, this is our first time, both Sonia and I, uh, here in Geneva, and um, the folks that we have met here uh, have been tremendous. Uh, we actually took the train yesterday and it was really amazing how willing people were to assist uh, in spite of the fact they didn't speak English and most of them and we didn't, we don't speak French. Uh, anyway, uh, so without further ado, what I'd, I'd like to do is get into what we are uh, here to talk about. Uh, 
the 10th year anniversary of the UN Convention of Persons with Disabilities. That was a tremendous milestone when that uh, convention uh, went into effect uh, because in a small country like Trinidad and Tobago, uh, persons with disabilities have been frequently sidelined uh, and ignored uh, where decisions are being made. Most of the time, almost all of the time, we were never at the table. Uh, and I was told by uh, a good uh, friend of mine, uh, if you're not at the table, uh, your issues are on the menu in that your lunch will be eaten and you will not be there to participate. You will not be there to uh, uh, a benefit. Your issues are not going to be looked after. And it's very important um, for us to be there when decisions are being made. Um, and so in Trinidad and Tobago today, uh, the issue of disability is taking front and center. We at the Torres Foundation have our office set up in Port of Spain. We also have one in Washington, D.C., um, where we live. Uh, and um, we have made quite a bit of progress in the area of technology and advocating for uh, conventions and, uh, uh, and legislation <laughs> uh, that is needed to advance the cause. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what we have actually done. And I've put together a very brief slideshow just to give you an idea of some of the things that uh, we have been achieved and are continuing to achieve. Um, so uh, my dear assistant, uh, Sonia Torres, uh, we need to bring up our first slide. Okay. So, um, so she, Sonia is working on a computer uh, with a piece of technology called a screen reader. A screen reader essentially is a piece of software that you install on the computer that makes it possible for a person with disability, to, uh, uh, as a person with visual impairment, to interface with the computer successfully. Um, the product that we're using is JAWS. JAWS is used by many people who are blind around the world. Title is Skype Trademark. Alt tab, red one dash PowerPoint, ready, red one dash PowerPoint, WR. F5, slide one. Okay, um, so assuming that everything is going right back there on the screen, uh, you should see our logo and the name of the organization. The foundation was established in memory of my father, uh, who was blind. He died in 1990 in 1998, uh, December 13, and in remembrance of him, we established the Torres Foundation because at the time in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, there really were no technology uh, training programs for persons with disabilities or people who are blind. We established a program called Blind Independence Through Technology, and as a result of that a program, uh, lots of people with visual impairments uh, have been trained. So uh, we didn't train every blind person in Trinidad, but we, it's very possible that we may have trained everybody who has trained other blind people in Trinidad. Uh, that's basically how it started. Um, so let's, let's hit the space. Slide two, Taurus Foundation received Hummingbird Medal. In recognition of our work, uh, the government of Trinidad and Tobago uh, awarded us with the Hummingbird Medal gold for loyal and devoted service to Trinidad and Tobago. And the, the picture that you see of me there, uh, I'm actually receiving the medal from the president at the time uh, for the work. Uh, the prime minister is also there um, in the picture. Um, the president was Max Richards, at the, uh, and he's no longer president. So this was back in 2004. And the prime minister was Patrick Manning, and he has since deceased. So, but anyway, back then, uh, in 2004, the government realized that this kind of work needed to be recognized, and they went out of their way to uh, award us with uh, this uh, national recognition in Trinidad and Tobago. All right, let's move next. Uh, 
Slide three, launch of Tobago VIP lab. Right. Now, in Trinidad, the National Library, they call it NALIS, National Library and Information System Authority, uh, they took a very proactive stance uh, in accommodating persons with disabilities, especially people who are visually impaired. Uh, when the foundation was established, one of the first things that we did was to approach the library, because at the library, technology could be made available for uh, the entire public uh, to come and use it, learn about it, understand it, and um, as I say, uh, you know, information is uh, king in terms of uh, adv advocacy and uh, you know, promoting oneself, whether it's in the area of education and, and so on and so forth. So we thought that the library was a very good place for us to uh, begin with uh, advancing these technologies in the society for persons with disabilities. Um, and so what you're seeing in this picture is actually our latest project that was completed just last year at the Tobago uh, Scarborough Library. Um, the picture you see there is uh, uh, Ms. Helen Johnson, and there's a picture of some of the technology that we installed that now makes it possible for someone who is blind in Tobago, as well as Trinidad, to go to the library, uh, learn the computer, learn the JAWS or magnification technology, and uh, basically uh, develop themselves. Uh, and, you know, in, as a result of these technologies being, being, made, a bit, <clears throat> being made available in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, you have a lot more persons with uh, visual impairments going to college, going to university, and securing jobs. Because prior to this, most of the jobs that were held by people who are blind were essentially basket weavers. Um, that's, that's essentially the only real job they had for people who are blind other than making boxes, yeah. So basket weaving and making boxes, those were your career choices. Um, and so we are very proud to have completed that project and we are continuing to work with the folks at the National Library uh, to uh, advance the cause. That's the next slide. Slide four, image results for Nalis building, Rajesh Muhammad okay. and Clint These Clint. two individuals that you see here are uh, musicians, uh, and trainers. Uh, one of the things that the library did was to establish uh, a studio, a state-of-the-art studio, uh, to accommodate persons who are visually impaired. Uh, so that uh, anyone who is blind can go to the studio, learn how you make music or produce a recording, and um, you know, possibly open up uh, you know, career uh, opportunities uh, for that uh, individual. Uh, one of the other things that we are doing uh, at the library is we are essentially trying to establish a service similar to what you have in, here in Europe and in the United States where we make uh, books available in audio format. Um, so we have actually worked uh, very closely with the National uh, Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, which is a division of the Library of Congress in the United States. And uh, last year, we actually produced our first uh, DAISY book. DAISY is a new technology that essentially makes it possible for uh, people with a print impairment, not necessarily just people who are blind, uh, to uh, access uh, the written word. Uh, the uh, production, the book can be read by a human reader, or it could be done in, sen in, sen in synthetic speech. Uh, and the text can also be made available. So you can actually have a human person reading, and you can also have the electronic text available uh, so that uh, you know, if, if there's a word in the text that is spoken by the reader and you don't know how to spell it, you can actually access the text and spell it. And that's actually a good thing because there are a lot of people who are visually impaired who are very bad spellers because they spend a lot of time listening to books as opposed to actually uh, reading uh, the words of the book. Uh, so that's something we, we definitely want to encourage. Uh, so our first book was was, that we 
well, it actually was not a book, it was a magazine. It was uh, called uh, Discover Trinidad and Tobago, and we worked very closely with the publishers uh, to, to produce that, um, that magazine. And if we go to the next slide. Slide five, learning through listening project with MEP okay. publications. We did a little bit of a soundtrack uh, with uh, the book, so it was with the magazine, so we, we, we didn't just, um, you know, read it. We had like a little interlude to it during the, the production of the recording, where we uh, interlaced uh, the music to sort of set, you know, the tone. <laughs> so it was our first effort, uh, and it was a bit, you know, elaborate. We're probably not going to do that for every book, <laughs> but we did it uh, here. Okay, um, and so this music is actually, you know, produced uh, by people who are blind and visually impaired. There were lots of other productions that were done uh, as well. And if we have enough time, I can play some more, but we don't do that right now. But, so the quality of music that, that was produced it was, was, was quite tremendous. Um, and this is very timely because I don't know if many of you heard of the uh, Treaty of Marrakesh that, well, I guess there are a number of different treaties of Marrakesh, but the one specifically that we're referring to uh, has to do with Through listening project with MEP slide six embedded um, or embedded. Yeah, the Treaty of Marrakesh essentially will make it possible for uh, organizations like the Torres Foundation that want to make materials available in all in alternative format. It will make it a whole lot easier for us to uh, produce uh, that material because as it stands right now, if we need to uh, produce a book in a re recorded format, we have to get the permission of the publisher. Uh, when the Treaty of Marrakesh gets adopted in Trinidad, we will be able to go ahead and record whatever books we, we so choose without that uh, restriction. And not only that, we'll also be able to share books um, with folks from other parts of the world, countries that have signed on uh, to the Marrakesh Treaty. So we are very happy about that treaty. And we are, we are happy that, uh, believe it, was finally adopted in September uh, of this year. So um, we are very excited about that development. And our little project here, uh, it's called Learning Through Listening, uh, was established just in time uh, to, make, to make this all come together. Trinidad hasn't signed on to it yet, but um, I've spoken with the uh, folks in the government down there, and they are studying um, the effort right now. And, um, Hopefully, within the next few years, uh, this will happen. Okay, next. Okay, um, so in slide seven, embedded a lay object document and unnamed. Right, so technology for the visually impaired makes it possible for persons with disabilities to access information that they may not have otherwise have had access to, or they would have to depend on someone to read. It makes the person independent. It makes the person employable. There are lots of standards that need to be established and adhered to in order for this uh, whole topic to be advanced. Um, and so in the United States, you have things like Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which says that companies willing, wanting to do business with the US government must make their technology uh, what they call 508 compliant. It must comply with uh, uh, standards and, and specifics uh, so that that technology can be accepted. Uh, it's not always adhered to, but at least, at least there are standards on the book and um, you, know, you can take legal action if you are in a situation where uh, you are at a job and a website or an application is not accessible to you and you're not able to do the job. Uh, so we, um, we are very, we're very proud of that uh, Section 508 legislation in the United States, and um, you know, we hope for, that it would go, continue to go forward. There's also the W3C standard, the World Wide Web Consortium standard for accessibility, and uh, those are standards that we, we wish that more uh, countries and companies uh, who make web technology uh, uh, available to the public can conform to those standards to make it possible for persons with disabilities to be included. And with the UN Convention, I believe it will definitely help 
Uh, I'm sure it's not a cure-all, uh, but uh, we, we, are, we remain hopeful, let's put it that way. Um, okay, so to move on, what I basically want to do uh, at this point is um, have Sonia give a little bit of a demonstration of how this technology works. Um, but before she does that, she'll give a little introduction of herself. So Sonia, tell us a little bit about yourself and what has assistive technology meant for you? Well, hello everyone. Um, I'm Sonia Torres and um, I'm an assistive technology specialist. So I provide computer training to people who are blind and low vision. I've been working with the foundation for about 12 years now. Um, I joined when we opened up the office in Washington, DC. Um, I have an eye condition called retinitis pigmentosa. It's a degenerative eye condition. So as I got older, my eyesight got worse. So when I was in high school, I was all right. I was able to read and write and, you know, get around okay. But when I got to college, that's when I started having problems with my eyesight. My major was in computers, but I was not able to see the computer screen or read print that well. And so basically, I just thought that was it for me. That was, you know, the end. I, I thought that I uh, would lose my sight and not be able to do anything. Um, I thought I would be a burden on my family and just basically would have to depend on everybody. But, um, you know, I was introduced to assistive technology and that's when uh, Mr. Ansel Torres came into my life. And uh, Basically, with the assistance of assistive technology, I was able to complete my education, and um, you know, I was uh, able to have a, a career. And um, so basically, it really opened up a whole new world for me. I was able to, um, it's like I was able to see again. And um, so it had made a, a big difference in my life. So I, um, and I wanted to do the same thing, you know, and help others, um, you know, make a difference in their lives. So I went into the assistive technology field. And um, so today I provide training um, all over the United States. I work with federal government employees, state uh, and local level as well, as well as have done some training in the Caribbean. So basically, yeah, so that's a little bit about myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. And what um, what would you say was perhaps the most rewarding part of, of this job? Um, I would say just to see other you know individuals succeed. You know something that they were not able to do before, and just to see them that they are able to do that. Just something simple as being able to access their email. You know. Um, they tell me that, you know, they, they said, well, you know, when I was losing my sight, I didn't think I would be able to read my emails again. But just showing them how to read their email, you know, they get very excited. And it's just seeing them, you know, happy that's, you know, I feel like I have succeeded. Yes, indeed. And um, the uh, IFRC is uh, sponsoring uh, this event. and. Uh, You've had some uh, personal encounters with uh, wars and, and, and disaster, and you've had to deal with, um, you know, getting help from organizations like uh, the Red Cross. Uh, I know, because we have discussed this before this event, uh, it's a little bit difficult for you to talk about it, but to the extent that you were able to talk about any of it, um, what, what comments would you have to make as a disabled person having to deal with wars, disasters, and organizations like IFRC? Um, you know, I, I, you know, went through a pretty, you know, traumatic um, period, and basically, I just wish that at the time, um, 
you know, there was uh, more help and I guess more access um, to assistance, you know. Okay. Um, yeah, she was uh, trapped in uh, Kuwait at the time that uh, the Iraq war uh, came to Kuwait and uh, had to escape through Iraq, Iran, I believe Turkey, uh, to get back to Pakistan where she was from originally. And um, so she survived that and um, I guess the rest after going through something like that, should be easy, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, okay, well, thank you so much, so much for that. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, we suffer through disasters just like uh, any other country, natural disasters. Uh, And uh, even though we, because we are so far south uh, in the Caribbean, we're actually the most southerly island of the, the tropical Caribbean chain, uh, hurricanes very often don't hit us directly. Um, they almost have to go in a reverse direction of their typical path to hit Trinidad, typically. Uh, a lot of the islands up the chain uh, especially Haiti, uh, they tend to get hit quite often. So our situation in Trinidad, you know, thank God, is not as bad. And Trinidadians have a way of saying that uh, God is a Trini. And, <laughs> and the people who respond to that and say, well, let's just hope he doesn't migrate. Uh, because uh, we have been very, very, very fortunate. We have dodged many hurricane bullets. But um, this year, and as in several uh, other years, uh, we have had quite a bit of difficulty uh, with flooding. Uh, right now, as we speak, uh, there's, a, there's a village right now in Trinidad that is maroon. The bridges have been washed out because of, not of a hurricane, but of these strange, heavy downpours that seem to be happening uh, pretty often right now on the on the island, um, so uh, you know there are all kinds of rescue teams that are going out there. You know right now as we speak, uh, I believe that's the village of Matlot, and, um, and there was a blind person who actually narrowly escaped death. It was actually reported in the papers uh, just recently, and um, I actually don't know him. I, I always seem to think I know everybody in Trinidad because <laughs> it's so small, but. Um, we, as disabled people, we run into uh, uh, you know, challenges just like anybody else. And in our situation is, is many times um, you know, a lot more uh, challenging because of our, our, our various disabilities. Um, many times when I take the plane, uh, the flight attendant comes to me and she says, uh, you know, gives me the briefing. Uh, you know, in case of emergency, the door to the nearest exit is, you know, five seats ahead or ten seats back or whatever. And, and don't worry, uh, if, if anything happens, we will come back and get you. And uh, I often say to them very directly, uh, ma'am, uh, don't worry to come back and get me because I guarantee you I will not be sitting here. And uh, because many times persons with disabilities are asked <laughs> to sit and wait uh, for rescue to come, and uh, it, they off it many times doesn't. And uh, as happened actually in, in, in the World Trade Center, many persons in wheelchairs uh, were stuck, I think, on the 32nd floor because they were told they were going to be rescued, and, and they weren't. Um, and that is. That's a challenge. I mean, it's a balancing act. Um, you know, how do you rescue both able-bodied and, 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 and disabled people? And how do you prioritize that? Because the feeling is, well, you know, if, if you try to help rescue disabled people, it'll slow down a lot of other able-bodied people from, you know, evacuating. So it's, 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 a, it's a balancing act. And I understand the logic of it, save as many lives as possible. Um, but that means disabled people are left behind. And, 
and that also is not good. So it's not, it's not a perfect system. Um, excuse me. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do uh, at this point is show a few uh, clips that we have on a, another slide, and then we would like to introduce um, Mr. Dominic Brathwaite, who is a Red Cross volunteer on the island of Trinidad, and he's sitting patiently waiting to give his presentation. He was supposed to be here. We had some challenges in getting him here, but he is still committed, and we have him by Skype, and you will be hearing him shortly. Um, we are having difficulty with uh, this particular slide because of some video issues, because it's very video intensive. Uh, so uh, the PowerPoint is not being very accessible at this point. So what I'm going to do is ask one of the techs, um, I believe, is it Cindy? Uh, if you can just come and run this, um, this particular slideshow, um, because some of the clips will play on keystroke command, but they don't, they don't all do. And it's something we just discovered this morning, so we didn't have a chance to really uh, run it through. Yeah, red two. Escape. Red one dash. Alt F4. Skype trade. Alt tab. IFRC presentation. I. Red two. Enter. Opening dash PowerPoint. Please wait dot dot dot. Red now what you're going to see PowerPoint. in the first slide is actually a rescue of a gentleman who was caught up in the East Rye River. The East Rye River is one of these uh, sort of, uh, it's like a big canal. Uh, you can even sail boats down there. They don't normally sail boats there. But it's, it's pretty huge. But when it's not raining, it's dry. Uh, and once it starts raining, F5. within a very short period, Slide it fills up. Uh, a lot of kids tend to end up playing in that dry river. And ever since I uh, was a kid, I, I would hear stories of people getting washed out to sea and drowning as a result of uh, playing in that, that driver. Actually, <laughs> as a kid, I actually went down there one time myself. But I was aware of the danger and didn't stay very long, and it was a very hot, a sunny day, so I didn't have anything to worry about. So, um, so yeah, so on September 10th, uh, this clip was shot. Um, basically, it was another a victim that was almost claimed by the East Rye River, Trinidad. Can we just run that rescue clip? It's the first one. Alt P. Um, and flood, Port of Spain floods, Port of Spain is the capital of Trinidad and Tobago, and it floods very, very, very frequently, and they have yet to lick that problem. Um, the next clip is a clip from American Red Cross, um, basically giving some tips about um, disabled people and uh, how uh, they should, repair, should prepare for disaster. Can we run that one? to be ready for emergencies. Individuals and families need disaster preparedness plans. For people with disabilities, this plan should include emergency contact numbers as well as complete medical information. You should complete a personal care assessment as part of your disaster plan. This plan lists the tasks you would be able to do yourself and what assistance you would need at all stages of a disaster, before, during, and after. It's also a good idea to form a personal support network sometimes called a self-help team. A self-help team provides assistance as needed in preparing for emergencies, as well as during and after a disaster. Okay, so there are lots of um, you know, very helpful uh, hints and uh, you know, very sound policies that uh, have been developed in the United States 
uh, to deal with disaster preparedness. Um, you know, there are definitely still stories of persons with disabilities going to rescue centers and um, people with cerebral palsy being mistaken for being on drugs. And as a result, they were ignored uh, uh, in the rescue efforts, or not, not necessarily rescue efforts, but um, at the shelters. Uh, and then you also have situations where people who are deaf um, are not able to communicate with uh, rescue workers because nobody in the team uh, speaks sign language. So, um, so there are a lot of good things that are happening in the United States in terms of um, increasing awareness about the need to accommodate persons with disabilities. Uh, I have a number of my own uh, ideas. Uh, I, you know, I haven't researched it extensively to see if, 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 if there's anybody with those ideas, and I actually think uh, there's uh, an opportunity for uh, invention here because, and it's not really that complicated. Um, one, uh, one of the things that I believe that can be done is, you know, like, you know, they talk about establishing a database a database of uh, you know persons with disabilities where they're located in case of disaster, so you can go there and find them. Well, if you, I mean, a database is very static, right? So the person may be living at that address, yes, but uh, because of the approaching disaster, they may have stayed with somebody else. Well, my suggestion is perhaps have some sort of uh, disaster preparedness bracelet. You know, they, when you go to these events. Uh, where they talk about disaster preparedness, they, they give you a flashlight and they, and they give you a radio. Uh, they even give blind people flashlights as well. Uh, I think it would be very, <laughs> I think it would be very helpful if you had sort of a, a disaster preparedness bracelet uh, that would actually have some sort of beacon that could be turned on in, in a situation where there's an emergency and you would have uh, you know, the necessary technology to track persons with disabilities who might be uh, in, in, a, in a situation where they need to be rescued. Um, so that way, uh, you know, it's more up-to-date information um, and, you know, it's, it's more precise. Um, so that, that's, that's one idea. And one of the other things that I find very strange that it does not happen is if you are a blind person in a building or even on an aircraft, how do you, I mean, other than counting the doors and all that kind of, how exactly, I mean, shouldn't there be a more precise way for a blind person to, to access, uh, you know, exits? Uh, on the plane, you have lights that lead to the exit, and then you actually have a bright, you know, red sign and all of that. But for blind people, you're left with counting seats. Why isn't there a very simple solution of having some sort of special audio signal at the exit so that they'll be able to find it? Because in the building I'm staying now, I said, you know, if, if, God forbid, I have to evacuate this building, I don't know where the exits are unless I ask or, or I hope for a good Samaritan to come by to, um, to assist me. That is something that should be triggered automatically if you have uh, a disaster. Um, so simple, simple things like that. And then uh, something you know, more, more basic, uh, especially in the Caribbean and especially in Trinidad where flooding is such a problem um, and drowning is such a problem. Uh, we at the foundation hosted a camp. Uh, we called it Camp Can Do, basically uh, you know, try to encourage kids to, to learn to do things that they you know, otherwise didn't think that they could do. So we had blind scientists come down and demonstrate how blind people can do science and do research. Um, we also took them horseback riding and fishing and that type of thing. Um, and it was, it was quite exciting. But one of the critical things that we did at the camp and, uh, was to show them how to swim. Because believe it or not, I mean, we had kids from all around the Caribbean, and I dare say somewhere around 75 to 80% of these kids did not know how to swim. And I'll tell you why that was important, why it is important, too, not just saving your own life, but Sonia and I uh, were in Tobago uh, just before our wedding. Uh, and I went over to the pool, and Sonia came, Sonia followed me, and I was talking to her to 
get to me. And next thing you know, I heard a splash. I didn't hear a scream, I just heard a splash. So I was thinking, initially I was thinking, someone jumped into the pool. And then, but then I called Sonia, I didn't hear her, and I, I mean, <laughs> I immediately went into, you know, automatic uh, emergency mode, and not even taking my towel off my shoulder, I just dove into the pool. And thank God, I was able to find her at the location of where she was. She was in the deep end and struggling to get to the surface, and I was able to to push her up and uh, on the side of the pool and 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 uh, save my future wife's life. If I was not taught how to swim at School for Blind. Sonia might not have been here today. And um, so that's how important it is to know how to swim. And um, that's you know, one of the reasons why uh, having that camp where I was able to introduce those folks to water safety and swimming and that type of thing was good. It, unfortunately, the, the camp um, hasn't, we haven't run the camp in a, in a few years. We'll probably do it again, but those things are really important. Anyway, um, without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Dominic Brafwit um, from Trinidad. He is a volunteer with the Trinidad and Tobago Red Cross, and I'd like to invite him to say a few words if we can get his audio all set. Escape. Red to Alt tab, IFR, Alt tab, Skype trademark, left bracket, three right bracket, dash to. Okay, we need to get his. The current connected devices colon dialogue. Which device did you? Context menu, tools menu, to move through items, press up or down arrow, C, change, leaving menus, Skype trademark, left bracket, three right bracket, dash to recommendation, end call button to activate, press space bar, dot, general audio settings, colon setup, speakers slash head, speakers combo box, speakers slash headphones, left parent, real tech, high definition audio, right parent, to change the selection, use the arrow keys. You select bring in combo box. You selected speaker to change the selection. But it's just speaker slash headphones. Left it's parent real tech high definition audio. Right parent speakers combo box. Speaker slash headphones. Left parent real tech high definition audio. Right parent to change the selection. Use the arrow keys. Skype trademark left bracket three right bracket dash to recommendation and call button to activate press space bar. The current connected devices headphones. 
speaker out. Skype trademark left bracket three right bracket dash to recommendation and call button to activate press space bar. Yep. So now we just need to get the microphone close to this, I suppose. Yes. Yeah. Dominic, hello. Hi, hello. Hey. All right. <laughs> yes. This is how I usually do it. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Okay, so uh, hi, my name is Nick Rathmeet. I am from Timbuktu. I have been volunteer the Red over seven years. Um. I, you may not be able to tell by looking at me, but I have a disability. I'm mentally ill. Of course, many of us have disabilities, you know, so that's why we are here today. Uh, I am a schizophrenic person. Schizophrenia is a mental disease which causes people to hear and see things. And according to some research I did online, schizophrenia affects around 51 million people around, around the world. No. I'm very pleased. I'm sorry I couldn't make the trip uh, due to some issues, but I am very pleased to um, make this presentation for the volume of all today. Um, please accept the fact that I'm there in spirit. Uh, so my journey at Red Cross began when I was seeing many different doctors and I was trying to find out more about my illness and what I wanted to do, do in life. I was really looking for work, but I kept, you know, bouncing around from job to job, doing odd jobs because I felt I couldn't handle the jobs because, you know, um, my mind couldn't handle it. My mind just couldn't take it. So one time I met two psychologists who were seeing me and they told me, I told them that I wanted to do charity work. And one of them told, just told me that I should join the Red Cross. And it was a decision that I would never, you know, look back on and regret. So I went the following week and I signed up to be a volunteer. I was very excited to be a volunteer because I felt I, like I was finally part of something. But uh, at first, no one wanted to work with me until they got used to me. And then I started out assisting during ambulance duties, which is where, you know, I learned first aid and then I um started you know working on ambulance the ambulance duties assisting and then i started branching off into different um doing different things such as the i was i branched off into the hiv aids department i assisted them there the disaster preparedness department the bit which um is an acronym for branch intervention team that's where we um, assist people during times of disaster in certain areas and community-based volunteerism. I'm really looking as a Red Cross volunteer to branch off into as many things as I can to grow as a um, Red Cross volunteer. Even I'm grateful that everyone at the Red Cross, you know, makes so light of my illness. Um, I work with such a friendly, knowledgeable, and caring staff, but things weren't always, you know, the way that they were. Growing up, I had a very hard time in school because I had a learning disability, which caused my mind to wander during class time. So my on upon looking up on this, my parents, especially my mother, and I thought I had ADHD, which is a acronym for Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder. But of course, later on, you know, I found out that it wasn't so. In, in addition to this, I was also, you know, made fun of and bullied by some of my peers. This made my stay in school very difficult, and I was still managed to do well enough in school. However, when I was 19, I started experiencing mental problems, like having hallucinations, and I was feeling very strange. I was really looking to continue my education in college, 
but I was forced to stop mainly because I found that I had the mental disease, schizophrenia. I started missing classes. I started, um, you know, I found it really difficult to concentrate in class. So I eventually dropped out of college for several reasons. You know, financial reasons, you know, mental reasons, that kind of thing. I even spent eight days in a mental hospital uh, so that they could figure out what was the problem. Uh, at that point in time, I was extremely depressed with myself because I had only a secondary school education. I had no money, no job. Um, so I kept searching for something until, you know, I found the Red Cross. Now, I, as of September 2015, I had reapplied for my college degree in Costa, which is a school in Trinidad. And I'm studying my associate's degree in information technology. Uh, eventually, I hope to do my bachelor's degree. You know, um, I must say that it's good that um, the WR Torres Foundation is really, we we're really learning to collaborate with, with um, people with disabilities. So it's um, what we stand for as the Red Cross. I feel as if there's no pressure to do my job and the other volunteers and members are like a second family too. I hope that in the spirit of what we stand for, that my story has made some kind of difference for all those who hear this. And I hope that our cause be stronger as the world sees us who we are and what we do. That people with disabilities, you know, we, we are really bringing some light into this issue and that, you know, that, we, um, that a, a lot more awareness is raised to this meeting today. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dominic. I really, really was um, hearing the details of your story for the first time, and I, I must say that uh, having a sister who just recently um, had a, a bout of um, mental illness, um, and I, I say about because I think to some degree she has recovered from it, but you know we don't know. Um, I really, um, uh, your story hits very close to home in that regard, and um, thank you so much. Um, this gentleman is, is so tremendous in terms of his approach to things. Um, you know, we had the difficulty with getting him here, and he really, really did want to come, and, uh, you know, but made the decision that uh, it, it couldn't work. There were some, you know, uh, complicated issues, but you know, he immediately said, "Okay, well, if we can't do this, you know, uh, um, you know, I could do a presentation." And he's, you know, ready to do it, and and uh, you know, very, very, uh, very uh, motivated uh, individual. And um, uh, we hope uh, to be working closely with the Red Cross in the near future in Trinidad. Um, and uh, you know, they have themselves down there said that uh, they need to make more efforts in uh, setting up you know appropriate policies for persons with uh, disabilities at the Red Cross um, but you know I think they are off to a tremendous start um, by uh, having someone uh, like Mr. Braffwood, um you know be in their service um, that is that is quite um, wonderful that it's it is happening uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, they are right now uh, rewriting the policy, uh, the national policy on persons with disabilities. They're expecting comments from me on that, and I'm very happy that they that they chose to <laughs> to invite my comments. Um, and part of it does have a, have a portion on uh, disaster preparedness and and such, uh, because in the past. Uh, they had a meeting, I think, right after that um, worldwide survey of disabled, disabled persons came out. They had a meeting right after that to talk about disaster preparedness. Um, and uh, the kinds of things that they were telling disabled people to do when a disaster, when disaster strikes just didn't make too much sense to us. I mean, one of the things they were saying is, well, we need to get, you, you, you need to get to this rallying 
point or meeting point. Um, well, you know, as a friend of mine said, you know, if I'm not on good terms with my neighbor, as we say in Trinidad, crapo smoke my pipe. In other words, tough for me because it is one of those things where, um, you know, it's not a simple matter of just getting to a rallying point. Um, so basically what they were trying to do at that time anyway, they were just talking about these general policies uh, on disaster preparedness and saying it in front of a disabled audience <laughs> and asking disabled people, well, what do you think about that? <laughs> well, uh, we didn't think much of it. And they never had a meeting uh, since, and that was, I would say, three or four years ago. Um, so I know in Trinidad they know it's not a perfect system. and there's, there's, there's a lot of room for growth and development in that area. Um, but you know these things don't get solved uh, overnight. But at least in Trinidad there's an awareness that, hey, something needs to be done because we're not on the right track. Um, so I am at least reassured by that. And having a convention that they are now party to, like the UN Convention on Persons with Disabilities, um, I believe that uh, that will be a tremendous impetus for them to get it right. And with folks like um, persons at the Torres Foundation and other organizations for the disabled and um, you know, friendly folks like uh, Tina and the folks here at the Red Cross and you folks here in Geneva, um, I believe uh, these are uh, these are, are resources that can be brought to bear in our tiny little corner of the world and you know a better place can be made for persons with disabilities uh, even when disaster strikes on behalf of the Torres Foundation all the folks uh, who uh, participated in the effort in Trinidad and Tobago uh, at the Red Cross down there uh, Ms. Margaret Elliott, the president uh, Dominic Thank you so much. We hope to be back. Dominic. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ansel and Sonia. Thank you, Dominic, also for sharing a little what was your experience. Um, I would like to now give the floor to the floor. And, and if you have questions or comments that you want to address to the speakers, this would be the time. Katarina? Yeah, they're bringing it to you. Thank you so much and good day all. I'm Katarina Tervakangas, I'm from the Mission of Finland. And firstly, wanted to thank the IFRC for organizing this event and all the panelists for, for their contributions and, their, uh, and sharing your experiences. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to uh, express how important is, it is to uh, pay special attention to the needs of uh, persons with disabilities in humanitarian emergencies. And as you probably all all are aware of uh, the Humanitarian World Summit last uh, May where, where the uh, Charter on Inclusion of Persons with Disabilities and Humanitarian Action was uh, agreed on with, with several stakeholders. And that is something uh, Finland has been spearheading on and we just wanted to, um, uh, to, uh, to call on all stakeholders to endorse the Charter to, for us to be able to that develop global standards and guidelines on inclusion of persons with disabilities in humanitarian action. So once again, just a, a big thank you for, for this. Thank you. Katarina. Um, yeah, and I have to reinforce that it was very supportive um, to have Finland and Australia and Thailand supporting the process uh, of the charter. And now also supporting, I don't know if many of you are aware, but the Interagency Standing Committee has decided to create a task team to develop guidelines, uh, practical guidelines on, uh, on how to include persons with disabilities in humanitarian action. Um, and we are part of that. Um, and we're proud that uh, 
our colleagues from Finland also continue to support this, these efforts. Um, do we have anyone else that wants to engage at this point? I just wish to add, and I'm very happy that Finland is here. It's actually the Finnish Red Cross that has uh, generously uh, supported the visit and talk by Ansil and uh, Sonia. So I'm very happy that you are here. Thank you. Is it time maybe for uh, some more music and some sandwiches? Is it okay? Very good. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you so much to the panel, to our moderator, to ICRC. I hope we will do this again and learn more and engage. Thank you so much and happy 3rd of December tomorrow. Thank you very much. Um, before, before we close, I'd, uh, I'd like to... Um, Oops. Yeah. Yeah. Alt tab, red to dash PowerPoint from Alt tab, IFRC presentation. Red one, red two. Yes, we in Trinidad at Christmas time uh, are, are very um, proud of the way that we celebrate. And what we'd like to do uh, as a token of our appreciation is to present uh, uh, Tina and her crew and everybody who was helpful and uh, participated in making this happen here in Geneva today. We would like to present a bottle of Pancha Crema which essentially is, <laughs> which essentially is a spiked eggnog, Trini style. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there's enough here to go around for everybody in the crew. Thank and you. I'd like to present it to you, Tita. Thank you, I'm coming here. Thank you, can I drink it right now? Uh, you can. <laughs> you. And we even, we even have some shot glasses that uh, comes with the prize as well. Okay. <laughs> Video. Zero one, it's Christmas again. Okay. <laughs> also, also direct from Trinidad and Tobago. We'll try them now. Thank you so much. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.